Yeah, this isn't going to shock you, but I'm really excited uh, for today's sermon because I get to use a lot of four-letter words, which if you know me is not, um, is not a surprise, but I know there's kids in the audience. Um, don't be too scared, parents. Um, have you ever heard the country song about a dad and his son? Yeah, I know there's a lot of them, but it goes, uh, oh gosh, a four-year-old said a four-letter word started with S, and I was concerned. And I said, son, now where did you learn to talk like that? And the, son, or the dad says, and I've been, or the son says, I've been watching you. Dad, ain't that cool? Yeah. So anyways, well, when I, <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm not on the um, worship like choir team. Uh, when I was eight years old, I had one of those uh, four-letter word moments that shocked everyone in earshot. It was one of my first softball games ever, and I remember it very well because we tragically lost and, uh, to the second best team in the league, and we were, you know, number one, of course. Uh, and after the game, we packed up our little bags in the dugout, and we walked out uh, to see a sea of supportive uh, parents. You'll get them next time, some mom said. You had fun, didn't you? A dad said. My mom and dad came over and gave me a hug, and whatever parent was in charge of post-game snacks that day handed out cupcakes with their team colors on them. But I wanted none of this. Did nobody see that we just lost to the muck dogs? <laughs> I'm literally eight years old. I sat on the ground by myself, bows in my hair, watching my teammates indulge themselves in icing and laughter. My mom realized that I wasn't a part of the group and something was wrong, and she bent down and asked, Georgia, like, what, what are you feeling? I looked at her and shouted the four-letter word, almost no eight-year-old shouts, Rage! <laughs> I feel rage! I heard my dad use the word in a sentence once, and while I'm not sure I fully knew what it meant, my emotions and my body surely did. I've never been a good loser. Probably, like you, I love the positive things in life. I love winning, sunshine, a perfectly brewed cup of coffee, dogs, Meetings that end early, <laughs> presents at Christmas, laughter, laughing with friends, s'mores by the fire, exam study guides, Casey Musgrave's new album, A Good Hair Day, conversations with my grandparents. I mean, there's just so much to love about this life. But John 12, 25 says, those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world keep it for eternal life. So... Now we have to wrestle with something. Jesus in his last days is telling us that if we are to follow him and keep our life, we have to hate our life. Hate our life? You know what four-letter word I want to tell Jesus? Rage! <laughs> Rage! Do you know how many people hate their life? Or have moments of hating their life? What are we doing here, Jesus? Jackie Hill Perry is a Christian speaker and author who is prominently known for her life story that she tells often, where she talks about being a gay woman who has since found the love of Christ and has been redeemed from her sexuality. Some of y'all might get mad. Focus on the Family has numerous resources and blogs and quotes from her, including a video with 1.2 million views on YouTube where she's preaching how the denial and hatred of our earthly body and our earthly desires is the only thing that can lead us into the love of God. She wasn't talking about greed and lust, but denying a very intimate and fundamental piece of DNA. Sexuality, identity, personhood, being. For her and many other evangelical theologians, we have to give up our desires, dreams, and ambitions to follow the hegemonic legality of religion. Don't be gay. Don't ask questions. Don't read certain books. Don't exegete or eisegete the text. Just read it for what it is on the paper and submit. Now, Jackie isn't obviously the only person who preaches this, but I think it especially hits hard coming from a fellow queer woman who studies the scripture just like me, and sees this text as a justification for the hatred of the very body God put us in. 
Did you know that LGBTQ plus youth are more than four times as likely to attempt suicide than their peers? I'm gonna give us some points because Dr. Sampson told me last semester, it's okay if I give points and I'm nervous, so I'm gonna give us some points. <laughs> Point number one, how we deal with scripture is one of the most serious, death-dealing, or life-saving things we could ever possibly do. So let's deal with this text a little bit more. This John chapter 12 is situated dramatically in the context of the festival of Passover. Before we got here, Jesus raised Lazarus. Mary anointed Jesus' feet, and Jesus has made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Everyone is responding to Jesus. The hour has come. Everyone is trying to see him. Chaos is breaking out. Think of the dialogue that started this service. Where are you going? What do you want from us? Have mercy on me. Could this be the carpenter's son? Where do you get your authority? Momentum is building up as it does in our season of Lent. And by this time, all eyes are on Jesus. And he says, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Eternal life. But New Testament scholar Amy Jill Levine reminded me that Jesus is drawn is not concerned with eternity. Throughout the book, Jesus doesn't want to save souls just for heaven. He wants to save people now, for now's sake. Now, I'm not going to assume that everyone in this room is on the same page as me, so just for a moment, please join me in imagining a world where eternal life is not some far-out distant place we all go to when we die. Because for the author of John, eternal life is already present and available right here, right now. So imagine what it would take for Winston-Salem, North Carolina, the United States of America, 2024, what it would need to look like in order to be in the midst of eternal life. Pretty sure it wouldn't include being number seven in the nation for its lack of food access. What would it take for Wake Forest School of Divinity to be in the midst of eternal life? Pretty sure it wouldn't. What is this utopia of eternal life Jesus is talking about? There are many science fiction books I could name here that attempt to articulate what eternal life could look like in our midst, or at least how we could rally together and try to get there. Octavia Butler, Ursula K. Le Guin, Philip K. Dick are some of the fantasy writers that have helped try to wrap my mind around what our reality is today and what it could be if the kingdom of God was fully realized. I was thinking about what these novelist protagonists had in common, and I found one thing. Rage. Rage at politicians especially seem to be a common theme. As whole planets and civilizations die in these books, it's always at the hands of the powerful who had the chance to stop it but didn't. The rage is required before a new way can be born. My second point is this. Hatred is required to save us. 1,800 miles below the Earth's surface, think Winston-Salem to Josh, Salt Lake City, Utah, but just straight down, is our planet's 10,000-degree core of molten rock and metal. Occasionally, just like this past Sunday in Iceland, this molten rock explodes out of the surface and destroys everything in its path. The Earth throws her fist in the air in rage and says, enough is enough. National Geographic taught me that it's the Earth's core that creates a stable atmosphere for abundant life. That shelters us from the sun. That protects us from incoming asteroids or whatever else is up there. That cultivates oxygen for us to breathe. For if we didn't have our core, we'd be just like Mars, baked in the sun with no chance of survival. I don't think it's a coincidence that the rage of our world is the very thing that also saves us. Rage is required for eternal life. When Jesus says we must hate our life to gain eternity, 
It is not our bodies, our souls that he wants us to hate, unlike what bad theology tells us. It's the systems, the perpetrators, the abusers, the wealthy, and authorities that keep us from ever having eternal life in the first place. It's not you, my dear beloved. It's not you, my struggling addict friend. It's a life that we're stuck in because the people who have come before us have done a really shitty job of creating a village where people don't have to die to realize we were always supposed to get a resurrection and eternal life. Queer people, black people, migrant people, poor people, and indigenous people should not have to die for our government, our churches, and global powers to realize we should get our eternal life too. So what do we do? We have to hate the way things are. Hate injustice and violence. And let the rage of our core come to the surface that we might make it known what eternal life is in store for each and every one of us. But those who love their life the way things are, who benefit and dwell in these systems, they'll lose it. They'll never get the reward because white supremacy, Christian nationalism, greed, and violence so cleverly disguise themselves as fulfillment and maybe even love, or at least something worth loving. But we can leave here knowing that we have the confidence that when Jesus says you can't love your life, he's not talking about your flesh. He's not talking about the joys of your life, no matter how big, how small. It's a call to hate the life that's shaped by systemic injustice and greed to discover that true life in Christ is marked by love and the promise of eternal life. My last point. Eternal Eternal life is cultivated by the decisions we make. We have a choice in front of us to love the status quo, the way things are, or to hate it, and to follow in the way of eternal life. What kind of community are we building here? One that hates the evils of oppression? And I'm not just talking about talking about racism. I'm talking about the fact that our white student body needs to do some serious soul searching on how to be committed to dismantling racism in a classroom setting. We have to hate the thought of any inclination of white supremacy or homophobia or transphobia entering into the cracks of our walls, and yet it happens every day. We can talk all we want, but we have a ways to go, my friends. Eternal life is cultivated by the decisions we make. When we rage against the powers that keep us from having eternal life with God, we're fighting for each other. Bad theology and the forces of the status quo have so many hating their life, feeling as though we are outcasts, unlovable, unacceptable in the eyes of God and our community. Where is the eternal life? Where are the people who who are willing to create villages and communities of eternal life? Where are they who hate these cards we've been dealt? I hated my life when I came out as queer just five years ago. My community couldn't hold me, my family couldn't hold me, my church couldn't hold me. I was told that to enter into the kingdom of God, I had to hate myself, using, that sa- using the same verse we're talking about today. I bet next Benedict was told to hate their life. And Katie Meyer, Robin Williams, Theology that hates flesh is deadly and has stolen way too many from us. Like baby slugs in the hush harbors, we have to love this flesh. Y'all know that sermon. Look at your hands, raise them, and kiss them. I want to end by reading this poem you have in your bulletin. When I came out to my close friends and family in 2019, all hope was gone. I thought all hope was gone. Like many young queer Christians, I spent many hours repenting and asking God to save me from myself. Within a couple of days, luckily, I stumbled upon this poem, and many of you may know it, and it quite literally saved me. 
It helped me realize that it's not me that I am to hate, but the forces that want me to drag myself through the desert repenting. I've since laminated it and put it in my mirror, reminding me of my place in this world. And now you have it too. This Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. She says, you do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. My friends, this is the eternal life we have to look forward to. This is the reality we can make. This is a model from which we can create our villages. But it doesn't come without a four-letter word that challenges and dismantles everything in the way. May we harness our power of rage. Amen. Amen.